Hello everyone and welcome to the next episode of the Disclosure Podcast. I hope you're all well, I hope you're all safe, I hope you're all doing okay. Today's podcast is a conversation I had with Dr. Melanie Joy when I was in Berlin back in November when I was doing my speaking tour throughout um, Germany, the Netherlands and Switzerland where I went to universities, schools, businesses, different institutions. Um, And so when I was in Berlin I was very lucky to be given the opportunity to speak to Dr. Melanie Joy. Um, and so that is this conversation that's going to be coming right up. Just just before we get into that, if you enjoy listening to the Disclosure Podcast, then please do leave a review. It really does mean the world to me. And also, if you enjoy listening to it, then I also do a patron-only podcast every month, which is basically where my patron community asks me questions and I hopefully give good answers to that. And so by signing up to my patron, you support the work that I do and my activism, but you also get access to that monthly podcast as well. And so let's get into today's episode. Um, but before we before we cut into the conversation, just thought I'd give a little overview about Melanie and also her latest book, which has just been released or was released um, between now and when the podcast was originally recorded. So Dr. Melanie Joy is a Harvard-educated social psychologist as well as a celebrated speaker. And she is the author of the award-winning book, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs and Wear Cows, An Introduction to Carnism, as well as Strategic Action for Animals and Beyond Beliefs, a guide to improving relationships and communication for vegans, vegetarians, and meat eaters. Dr. Joy has given her acclaimed carnism presentation and trained vegan advocates on six continents, and her work has been featured in major media outlets all around the world. Now, Dr. Melanie Joy's, her latest book is called Getting Relationships Right, and it's available to buy now, which might be something you'll be interested in, since we have all this time in this world, in the world right now, um, and reading is a really good way of, of utilizing the time that we have. And so, Getting Relationships Right is similar to Beyond Beliefs, if that's one of the ones that you've previously read, but it's for more of a mainstream audience. And so, it's a one-step guide to developing relational literacy, so the understanding of an ability to practice healthy ways of relating. Anyone who reads it will learn how to be more empathetic, practice greater integrity, examine how their choices impact others, including, of course, animals, and think critically about systems of oppression. And so that's available to buy now, if that's something that you'd be interested in. But without further ado, let's get into the conversation. I really hope you like it. Thank you so much, guys, for listening. And here it is. So welcome, uh, Dr. Melanie Joy. Thank you so much for joining me on the uh, on the podcast. Thanks. It's a pleasure. I'm, I'm surprised and really glad it worked out. Very last minute. And finally, here we are. We've been wanting to talk for a long time. So this is great. Yeah, we've been emailing probably for about 18 months now, trying to like reach some time to, to talk. Um, so now it's finally happened. And, and rather last minute, just because I was doing a talk in Berlin last night at the university and and Chris from ProVeg was like, hey, you know, Melanie's going to be around tomorrow. Do you want to do a podcast? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so here we are. Um, so let, let's keep it kind of very open and, and brief and quite organic but let's start off really simply um obviously you've been doing a lot of vegan advocacy work and i guess um encouraging people to reevaluate their lifestyles for, for a long long time now um and so i'm kind of very interested what led you to veganism on your personal kind of journey well yeah i have been um advocating veganism for i think 30 years now so it's right? been a really long time wow. yes uh so back since since 18, 1989 actually um and i was 23 then so um but it was yeah it really emerged out of my own personal journey um i was you know like many people i grew up many people in, in the u.s anyway i grew up with a dog who i loved um and i grew up eating meat eggs and dairy and i was always a person who cared about animals um i would you know of course never want animals to suffer or to cause animals to suffer um especially when that suffering was so intensive and and so unnecessary and yet i of course ate them every single day and quite a bit actually i was like the meat lovers pizza girl i used to get domino's pizzas with you know every kind of meat on it extra cheese um but it was um you know, it wasn't until I ended up getting sick when I was 23 years old. I was um, sickened from eating a hamburger that was contaminated with Campylobacter. And I wound up hospitalized. Um, and like just after that experience, I didn't want to eat meat or eggs again. And then dairy came shortly thereafter. But it really, it was, it was meat and eggs. I was just, it wasn't in my you know, to my recollection, a quote unquote ethical decision I made, except to take care of my body, which is ethical, of course, but I was just really disgusted by the idea of eating meat. Um, and so it was when I was um, looking for information about how to cook vegetarian, like how to be a vegetarian, um, that I stumbled up upon information about animal agriculture. And what I learned just shocked and horrified me. 
So, but what shocked me perhaps even more was that nobody I talked to was willing to hear what I had to say. They were always like, don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal. So <clears throat> this was really my introduction into veganism. And then it was the response of the people around me who were rational people, caring people, just like I had been, who were just completely shutting down the conversation. Every time I tried to share with them information I felt was completely relevant and important for them to know, um, that really led me on the journey of the work that I ended up doing for the movement to support the movement and, and beyond the movement. Yeah. And so a part of that, that work that you did was you, you, you well, coined the phrase carnism. Mm -hmm. And so could you describe what carnism is? Is. Sure. I um, I eventually uh, studied psychology. I enrolled in a doctoral program to study psychology, and I was curious about what is the psychology. The question I had was, what is the psychology of violence and nonviolence? How is it that good people participate in harmful practices right. without realizing what they're doing? And um, and then I focused my dissertation on the psychology of, of eating animals, and that led me to discover what I came to call carnism, which is the invisible belief system or ideology that conditions people to eat certain animals. It's, it's basically the opposite of veganism, right? We tend to assume that only vegans and vegetarians follow a belief system. But the only reason that most of us learn to eat pigs but not dogs, for example, is because we do have a belief system when it comes to eating animals. When, when eating animals is, um, is not a necessity, which is true for many people in the world today, then it's a choice. And choices yeah. always stem from beliefs. Yeah. So that was what led me to coin the term carnism. That's interesting. I think that we do have this idea don't we that, that becoming vegan is based on a belief system but but eating animals is somehow just you know it seems so obvious in a way that it must be a belief system then that we, we we cling on to right but it's also something we never think about because it's so culturally i guess and socially ingrained yes well and even more than that it's not just carnism is not just a belief system it's a particular type of belief system it's an oppressive system right it's a well first of all it's a dominant belief system and that means it's invisible it's it's entrenched it's so widespread that its tenets its teachings essentially are seen as a given rather than cho a, a choice you know it's basically carnism is basically woven through the very structure of society it shapes you know norms laws beliefs behaviors etc but it's invisible so we don't recognize that this carnistic bias is uh, is really it's everywhere so when we study nutrition for example most people don't realize that they're studying carnistic nutrition right, right right so so it's a widespread ideology or a dominant ideology and carnism is also a violent ideology you know, meat cannot be procured without killing. And of course, egg and dairy production cause extensive harm to animals. And, and violent ideologies or oppressive systems like carnism run counter to core human values, particularly the values of compassion and justice. And so what carnism needs to do is to use a set of psychological and social defense mechanisms so that um, rational, compassionate people engage in irrational uncompassionate behaviors without fully realizing what they're doing. So this is why, um, you know, most people never really reflect on the fact that they're eating animals because the way, the whole way the system is structured, uh, it, it, it's designed to keep them from even realizing that they do have a choice and that there is another way to be. And I think that's, you said something which I think is really important, which is that carnism enables good people to do bad things. And I think when I became vegan, and I think when I particularly started advocating for veganism, I, I felt that I was probably quite misanthropic and I was blaming humans for their actions and I, and I think I found it very easy to create this this kind of like binary where it's like this is what a good person looks like and this is what a bad person looks like and it's it's a very destructive mindset and so actually what I found very humbling actually but also really constructive was recognizing that you know good people do bad things and this kind of carnistic you know or, or consumption of animals or, or the use of animals is an example of a bad thing but it doesn't define someone as being wholly bad and if we can recognize that people are good but are, are trapped almost in this kind of like but invisible belief system then that 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 allows us to kind of 
It's not that we empathize, it's not that we understand people, but we can at least have some form of validation or find validation in why they do, they do the things they do. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And this is one of the reasons it's so important for vegans to recognize carnism because you know, it does enable us to understand that good people can participate in harmful practices and yeah. that doesn't necessarily make them bad people. We are all embedded in myriad, multiple systems of oppression. My new book um, called Powerarchy, understanding the psychology of oppression for social transformation actually looks at it applies carnism but but beyond right it builds on what i talked about in carnism to really look at the psychology of oppression in general and in that book i talk about how you know humans are we are remarkably uh, good at compartmentalizing. <laughs> yes, I mean, right. there are plenty of vegans who are advocating for non-human liberation um, and, you know, ha who have examined and become aware of their own speciesism, who nevertheless are very resistant to examining and even hearing about their other forms of privilege that they might have, male privilege and white privilege and class privilege and so forth. So we, you know, so often we feel that we've stepped out of one ism and we've kind of got it you know, we're, we're no longer part of the problem. But more often, we step out of one ism only to remain mired in many others. And so it can be really helpful, particularly for vegans who are struggling with frustration and anger, struggling to be able to really feel empathy for and connect with non-vegans, um, to appreciate that all of us are part of these multiple systems of oppression. And, um, People stay stuck in the systems. You know, people will not change a behavior and a change in attitude until they're ready to make that change, until they feel safe enough to do so. Yeah. And it might seem very easy and very straightforward for those of us who just stopped eating animals and were like, one day, I'm done. Yeah. Which is most people, at least who are active in the movement, most of the... Um, you know, the most activists, or many activists, I should say, are those people who were like, okay, I'm done. Yeah. I'm never eating animals again. Yeah. And then assume that everybody else is like that or should be like that. And if they're not like that, that just makes them bad. Mm -hmm. But um, people need to feel safe enough to make the changes that we're asking them to make. This is not justifying eating animals at all. It doesn't mean we don't hold people accountable right. and work to change problematic behaviors, but we need to appreciate psychology and why people stay stuck in places that they do. I think that is so pertinent to the conversation right now in the movement. And I think what, what you said before is interesting. I, I, I kind of think that the, the ethical aspect of, of that kind of vegan transition is, is similar to the environmental one in the sense of, you know, veganism is, is very beneficial for the environment, but it's by no means the only thing that we need to be looking at within our own behaviors to help the environment. And so I think when it comes to like values and morals and how we treat others in the world, like veganism is a great stepping stone, but it's not the only thing that we need to be addressing within our own lifestyles. Absolutely. So, so it should be, I see like it's like the, the biggest first step that we can make and then we have to look at all these different you know aspects of the world that we have an impact on sustainability but also in terms of like oppressive systems and how how we view humans and non-humans within that as well and I agree it's not about it's not about excusing people's behavior it's but it's about holding people accountable but understanding and I think again what you just said right at the end of that is is really important as well that I, I, often we hear in conversations, um, someone will get really angry at a non-vegan because maybe the non-vegan's like, well, I just like the taste of bacon too much. And we can take that kind of like excuse on face value, but we ignore that there's this whole system behind it. There's like that cultural system, there's, and, but there's also these kind of like very old, archaic, transgressive kind of beliefs as well that we've probably taken from, you know, when we were nomadic and we, we brought on. And so we need to understand that when people use excuses, they're not just saying it on face value. There's this whole system behind them that's led them up to this point. And understanding those systems is is liberating, I think, in terms of our, yeah. our own communication. Yeah, and I would even see those uh, those expressions of somebody's beliefs not even as excuses, um, but rather as justifications. Right. You know, learned justifications rather than just personal excuses. And and it's really true. And I think it's um, it's it's very important for for everybody, but particularly, particularly for those of us who are trying to create a better world for all beings, to appreciate the way that, um, to appreciate this broader overarching uh, way of thinking 
that can get in the way of us, that can actually drive us to become the very thing we're trying to transform. Right. And so in my, in my book, Powerarchy, I actually talk about, you know, as you're saying, you know, veganism is, it's incredibly important. It's not the solution to all the world's problems, but no solution will be complete without it. Absolutely um, right, yeah. But really, it reflects a mindset that reflects a value set. It essentially reflects a way of relating. You know, when I think about veganism, I think about it as a way Way of relating to yourself, others, and the world. And this is one, one um, expression, one manifestation of a deeper commitment to healthy relationality, to wanting to move through the world and relate in a way that does less harm and that reflects compassion and reflects justice. And when you think about it, um, in, in, my, in my book, Powerarchy, I look at oppression through the lens of relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, oppression as a, as a psychological phenomenon, but even more specifically as a relational phenomenon. If we look at um, oppression, systems of oppression, right? Just like, you know, carnism, speciesism, sexism, racism, classism, and so on. And we also look at other systems that are violent or problematic, abusive systems, like an abusive relationship or a dysfunctional workplace, yeah. even. All of these systems have the same basic structure. And all of these systems reflect precisely the same mentality. Um, in even more specifically, they, re they all reflect a belief in a hierarchy of moral worth, a belief that some individuals or groups are more worthy of being treated with moral consideration, essentially of respect, with respect than yeah. others. Yeah. And when we look at the problems in our world, you know, oppression and abuse, we can see that they all reflect relational dysfunction. It's a dysfunction in how we relate as social groups, as individuals to one another, to non-human animals, and also to the environment. So I completely agree with what you're talking about, being vegan. You know, we have to be very careful not to get into this, stuck in this identity that I'm vegan, I've got it, this is it. It's, it's not about just being vegan, it's about being committed to relating in a way that's healthy. And right. that means relating in a way, interacting with others and yourself in a way that reflects integrity, Mm -hmm. Meaning, are you practicing compassion and justice yeah. and honors their dignity? Right. And if you do that, you cultivate connection in your relationships or in your interactions. And when you don't, you end up with disconnection. Yeah. And so, uh, absolutely. And so we, we, we talk about um, understanding, having, uh, I guess, some form of like validation to, to why people, uh, uh, you know, ardently defend something that they probably fundamentally disagree with. So let's say that we, we're engaged in conversations with people. Actually, let, let's talk about family, because I think this is probably the most important one for a lot of people listening. Um, and, and selfishly, I'm, I'm intrigued to hear what you might say to this. But to get, just bring us into that question, um, I have a little personal story. So the first, uh, we'll use the word Activism, it's quite loose, but the first form of activism I ever did is I emailed my parents, right? I'd been vegan for about a year, um, and I, I watched, interestingly, the, the secret reason why we eat meat, the, the video oh, that you made in video. 20, yeah, okay. back in 2015. And I remember watching it, and afterwards, I thought, this is a great video. It's like so non judgmental, but it really lays everything out. Like, you can't argue with it. It's got the footage in there for, you know, people need that little graphic footage push. It's got everything. To, but it's done in a really non-confrontational way. And I was like, this is what I need to send to my mum and my dad. This will do it. Anyway, so I sent the video to my mum and my dad in an email that was basically like, hey, you know, hey mum, hey dad. They're both divorced, so they both got a separate email. And it was like, I'm, you know, you know, I'm vegan. These are the reasons why. So I did like a paragraph on ethics, a paragraph on the environment, a paragraph on health. By the way, check this video. I think it's really great. My dad didn't reply to me, but my mum replied to me. And the first thing she said was, I think animals are put on this planet for us to eat but she's not really religious. That was very confusing for me because mm. she doesn't go to church. Mm -hmm. She doesn't read the Bible. I'm not baptized, no, no, nothing religious really in our family. My grandma, but not my mum. But then she also said about synthetic proteins and that I was gonna die. And that really made me upset and angry because I was really outraged by that. Um, and I think we all have lots of problems with, with, with family. I, for me, they're the hardest people to communicate with. I would yeah. rather speak to a, to a farmer than my mum about veganism. Well, you know? yeah, I mean, and, and I, 
I have spoken with thousands of vegans around the world, as have you, and it's the same story over and over again, yeah. right? Where family is is so often the hardest, the most frustrating, the most heartbreaking in some ways. And vegans often also just say that becoming vegan, you know, was in many ways one of the most empowering experiences, maybe the most empowering experience of their life. And then they find that after they become vegan, their relationships and communication start to break down. Right. Right. With friends, with family, and also even beyond that. So um, it's a great question. I can, um, I actually, I speak to this quite a bit in my book, Beyond Beliefs, which mm -hmm. is a guide for vegans, vegetarians, and meat eaters and relationships and communication. And to, to speak directly to your question, why is it so hard to, with family? I mean, I mean number one, people are at different stages of readiness to hear the vegan message. Yep. You know, there, there are so many different factors that determine whether somebody is going to be or how receptive somebody will be to our message. Let's say, you know, we communicate quite effectively. Um, you know, you can communicate with somebody who's extremely defensive. You can communicate with somebody who's quite open. You can communicate with somebody who's like afraid of going vegan because of what it might mean to their lives or, or their families and so forth. So there are so many different variables that determine whether a person is um, or how, how ready a person is to hear the message. Um, and we don't pick family, you know? So we often just assume that people who are members of our own family, by virtue of being members of our family, we, the vegan, must be ready since we were. Right. But they're not, they're just other people. Yeah. You know, they, they may be much less ready than some of the strangers we encounter on the street. Like we can't, so, so one problem is that we assume that there's a level of readiness simply because we identify with family members as being like us when it's often not there. Another problem is that there are often long-standing power struggles in okay, place, yeah. right? So they get triggered when you start talking about veganism or carnism. Really, it's so important to remember that when we're talking about veganism and carnism, when we're talking about veganism, right? Underneath this difference is a relationship between people, and that's where the focus needs to be. So when you're dealing with somebody you've already have a relationship with, and there's an established dynamic between you, a power dynamic, say, or, you know, there's just long-standing grievances and frustrations. And then you bring on top of that, you know, a difference like veganism and carnism, a difference that many people are already defended against. It can really be explosive. Yeah. Um, it also is true that I think one of the reasons vegans struggle anyway so much in, with family relationships is because we have a desire to feel we know that humans are hardwired to seek meaningful connections with others yeah. we know that and many of us have a desire to have a meaningful connection with those who are closest to us who are often our friends and our, our close friends and our family mm -hmm. and it's very hard for vegans often to feel connected with people whose behaviors violate some of the principles we hold most dear and that pain of disconnection can often fuel our desire to quote unquote convert people in our family. There's this unconscious or maybe conscious sense that if only you were vegan, I would be able to feel connected with you again because I miss that feeling of being connected with you. Something that I think I found within my own personal family dynamic was that you know my family tried to raise me with what they perceived to have you know be good values good morals they want they wanted me to be like a well integrated citizen and you know and all these different things that I think most parents you know hopefully want from their kids and I think that when parents go vegan when their children do it requires I think that requires so much humility within the parent because they raise their children a certain way so I went vegan just before I was 21 around 21 and I said oh, the reason I'm vegan is because I think to use animals is immoral and so I'm telling my parents the way they raised me is immoral now it's not directly me saying that but it is in a way directly me saying that because I'm saying that this is what I think now you've given me these bad morals and you're still living by bad morals and so I think just from us declaring our veganism for those reasons will automatically create a very natural and understandable friction and then it's almost our job to reduce that friction rather than expecting our parents to just come around to it straight away because they're automatically going to feel threatened I think you know when you have these like dynamics of like parents teach children and you know when a child all of a sudden starts teaching their parents it's disrupting these kind of like archaic power dynamics maybe but yeah certainly for some parents that's that's more true for some parents yes. than yes. others and, and you're absolutely right and it's why 
it's important for us to frame our message in a way that increases the chances that it will be heard the way we intend it to be and not end up creating even more defensiveness, you know, because these carnistic, this carnistic mentality, it's, it's internalized and it just creates this automatic defensiveness in, in non-vegans, essentially. It's like, all you have to do is say I'm vegan and you can like feel the wall going up. So yeah. we need to be really careful and strategic to the best of our ability about how we communicate about the issue. And, um, you know, this is why, for, you know, talking about, you know, why I, when, when somebody asks you, why are you vegan and sharing your own story as opposed to, you know, just your beliefs, like I think it's immoral. It's quite different than saying I became vegan because I heard about, I learned about what happened to the yeah. animals and I, I didn't want to be a part of that. And, and here's what I learned. So there are certainly ways to frame the issue um, to increase the chances that people will hear it and respond to it. So true. And uh, let, So let's say that now we're, we're talking about, um, we talked about the atomic to non-vegans, specifically family and friends. But let's say, like, obviously, the wonderful thing about the vegan movement growing is that it brings in people from all different walks of life. And the fact that, was, demographically speaking, we're so varied now is really wonderful. But I guess the, the, the crux to that is there's people that are always going to have differing opinions, different views. People think some forms of activism is better than other forms. And everyone, every, you know... It's very hard to quantify effectiveness in certain in certain things in certain regards, but we have a general idea of what could be more effective than others. But how do we offer, as a, as a movement, constructive feedback to one another in a way that, that that avoids this kind of feeling of I guess we use words like infighting or like blame culture? How how do yeah. we foster a sense of progressing together through open dialogue with each other? I think that's to me, I found that very challenging to, to see how we do that. Challenging and really important. I mean, this is what we do through our Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy, SIVA. We, mm -hmm. we train vegans largely in effective communication strategies. And, um, you know, learning effective communication is one of the most important things any of us can learn, you know, which is, it's a component of, of relational literacy. You know, like relational literacy is the understanding of an ability to um, practice healthy ways of relating. And most of us don't learn this. Most of of us haven't gotten any training in it. In fact, we've learned the opposite because most of us were not raised um, in the healthiest ways. And yeah. if our parents didn't screw us up in some ways, then <laughs> Hollywood did it for them. And if Hollywood didn't, then the government did and yeah. so on and so forth. So we haven't had healthy modeling, but you know, there are a few practical things that, that we can do. Um, you know, one of the things that I always recommend and especially you know, I, I talk about this in my book, Powerarchy, you know, recognizing this mentality that underlies all forms of oppression and, and, uh, and abuse, this, this power, what I call the powerarchical mentality. One way you can tell whether you're under the influence of this way of thinking is, uh, is to notice whether you're feeling one of the two emotions of either contempt or shame. These are two sides of the powerarchical coin, as it were. Um, powerarchy is the, the term I use to describe the, the meta system of oppression. Right. It's like if we think of oppressions like carnism, speciesism, sexism, and so forth, the yeah. spokes on a wheel, yeah. powerarchy is like the hub, right? right? So it's, it informs all of the systems. Um, so when you feel contempt, that's an indication that you've placed yourself in a position of moral superiority. Right, okay, yeah. And it's a red flag. Yep. If you feel contempt, chances are that says more about you than whoever you're feeling contempt about. Yeah. And if you feel shame, that's an indication that you're perceiving yourself in a position of moral inferiority. So a lot of, it, let me back up. These are both, uh, these are both emotions that just exist in relationship, in comparison. They only exist when we're comparing ourselves, for example, to another, or even when we compare ourselves to an idealized version of ourselves. Whenever we feel contempt, we almost automatically feel justified in communicating or relating in a way that's toxic, mm, that, yeah. that doesn't honor dignity. We're perceiving somebody as less than, in other words, less worthy of being treated with respect. And so this infighting that we can see, this is powerarchy is, um, you know, when we flip the ladder of powerarchy, we end up with more of the same. Basically, it's, we, we are, you know, so many of us working for social justice and animal rights, we're speaking out for justice, but we're using 
language and an approach and a, and a means that's unjust, mm -hmm. you know, berating the people who we disagree agree with, for example. So we need to really learn to tune inside, look inside ourselves, ask ourselves, am I feeling contempt right now? Before communicating with somebody, you know, pause and ask yourself, what do I imagine this other individual might feel when they read what I'm about to post? Yeah. Really ask yourself that yeah. because the antidote to both contempt and shame is the same. It's empathy. Right. It's empathy. So it means that we're disconnected for our empathy for others or for ourselves when we feel one of these emotions, even on a more practical level. Um, we can think about, you know, our, our communication is you know, every communication has two parts. It has the content. It's what we're talking about being vegan or certain types of vegan strategies or effectiveness or abolition or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it's the process and the process is how we are communicating the process matters more so if you think about a communication you've had or a conversation you had like six months ago or a week ago or a year ago you might have forgotten entirely what the content was you might not even know what you talked about yeah. but you probably remember how you felt in that conversation because the process determines how you feel when your process is healthy, you can talk about anything. Our differences in the movement are not the problem. It's how we relate to our differences that's the problem. And particularly, it's making up a story about those who are different and perceiving them as inferior, as somehow morally inferior, and therefore feeling that we have the right to communicate in a way that um, does not reflect integrity, meaning to communicate in a way that's not compa not the way that we want would want to be communicated with. Right. If we were on the receiving end of that communication, we need to be mindful of this. We need to. The most important thing, in my opinion, for us to do as a first step, is to recognize that it is in fact problematic to communicate from a place of contempt. That it really is deeply problematic to communicate in a way that doesn't honor somebody's dignity. That means we communicate in a way that frames and, and perceives them as somehow inferior. It shames them. It's shaming communication. Yeah. And studies have shown again and again that this toxic communication, what I call power hierarchical communication, is contagious. When you're on the receiving end of it, you're more likely to give that same kind of communication back to right. whoever gave right. it to you. And whether you do or not, you're also more likely to give it back to somebody else later in the day. Yeah. It's contagious. Um, and it is, is deeply destructive. And I think the problem with social media is it, it's easier to empathize someone when you're communicating with them in person, right? But when, when you're looking at like a little icon on the screen, you dehumanize the person you're speaking to. And so it's much easier to react in this kind of like, it's almost like a form of catharsis, isn't it? I suppose like you've got this pent up frustration, anger, someone said something to you, so you're, you know, penting up. And so it's just cathartic just to, to say something back to them and, and release kind of well, like- Well, temporarily and you temporarily, feel even worse yeah. later. True, it's like a temporary catharsis. Yes, absolutely true, but it's not a long-term sustainable form of, of, of expression. No, you're right about no, that. No, you're, you're toxifying yourself every time you do it. True. And everybody knows. People know what it feels like because after you're done, you know, after the high wears off from the gotcha statement, yeah. you know, on some level, we all know, especially those of us who are really deeply committed to and concerned with creating a more compassionate world, yeah. we know that that is toxic and harmful and damaging. I think fundamentally what we have to realize in our advocacy is empathy plays a huge part. It doesn't matter who we're talking to, whether it's each other, we're in the movement, people outside of it, like a, a, an empathy, like a, a kind of um, a psychological validation of other people's, uh, an understanding of where people come from, I suppose, is important. And then understanding this kind of the mechanisms and the and, and mechanism, this you know invisible belief system that puts people in a, in a situation where they're perpetuating ideologies and beliefs that actually probably go against how they fundamentally feel as individuals and I think that is very important and so I think like in our advocacy yes I I've not thought about letters before and actually you saying this has really reaffirmed a lot of what I say to people which is don't put the pressure on yourself to turn people vegan that's what that's what we want of course it's what we want but it sets us up to be disappointed always because people take time they you know they need to explore these ideas for themselves we have to remind ourselves 
what worked for us? How did we reach this point? It's very important that through communication, we study well exactly what you well, exactly what you're educated in social psychology to understand these mechanisms within people. Learning about it absolutely is important. It's I wrote um, uh, my book Beyond Beliefs as a way to condense a lot of these principles and this understanding specifically for vegans who want to improve their communication um, with other vegans and also with the non-vegans um, in their lives. So you know, hopefully that. Can can be a helpful tool for people. We also have resources at veganadvocacy.org and carnism.org for people. Exactly. And where can people find out about SIVA trainings if they want to, to visit one in their local areas? Um, veganadvocacy.org. Okay, excellent. And also you have um, a TEDx talk, um, which is in the top 1%, I think, of all TEDx talks ever, right? So that's really amazing. And it's a wonderful tool as well. So um, to go check that out on YouTube. Also, I, I mentioned something in, in the in the podcast, which was the secret reason we eat meat, um, which I think, again, like I said, is a really great video. So check that out as well. Um, and yeah, and um, and your books can be found on Amazon. And- they can come to carnism.org um, and melaniejoy.org. Excellent. Okay, fantastic. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Melanie Joy, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and speak to me. Um, I hugely appreciate it. And I hope that the listeners have found what we've said to be insightful. These are issues that come up all the time and I think always will because <clears throat> conversation and discourse is, is fundamental to human coexistence but in terms of vegan advocacy it's also fundamental as well. So I hope yeah. people have learned a lot and feel inspired to, to reach out to look at more of your um, educational resources. But thank Thanks. you so much for joining. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure.